The 2020 pandemic caused by the COVID-19 virus has changed the way many of us work. Some people have lost their jobs, some of us have been working from home, and some jobs may disappear completely. In this episode, we talk about jobs that no longer exist and new jobs that have been created. Welcome to Aprender Inglés with Reza and Craig. Hello, and if you are a new listener to the podcast, welcome. My name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And with nearly 50 years of teaching English between us, Reza and I are going to help you improve your English and take your grammar, your vocabulary, your pronunciation up to the next level. How are you doing, Reza? I'm fine, Craig. I'm enjoying the sunshine here in sunny Valencia. How are you? I'm enjoying the air conditioning in the flat <laughs> and I'm trying not to go out because it's far too hot and humid for me outside in Valencia in July. First this week, we have a voice message from Nicolas from Colombia. Hi, Reza and Craig. It's Nicolas from Colombia. It's been a long time since I last reached out to you. And as always, it's a pleasure uh, to listen to your podcasts and very grateful for the content you produce and the work you do and how you always encourage us to practice our English and to send you voice messages. So I thought it might be a good idea for us to practice our English that some of us might not have jobs that are very common or professions or be studying something that we can share. So I, I thought I'd start with mine. I'm studying biomedical engineering and that's a profession that's fairly new and it's taking um, importance lately because it's been helpful on the development of artificial respirators and many other things for this pandemic and this whole th situation. And that degree, it's an engineering program that's similar to electronic engineering, but with more of a health focus to understand how the human body works and how you can uh, replace things that are not working and uh, improve things and that kind of things. Thank you guys. Thank you very much for taking the time, Nicolas, to send us your wonderful voice message. Fantastic pronunciation and very, very good English. And your message got us thinking about new jobs that are developing and maybe jobs that are gradually disappearing or maybe jobs that we don't even do anymore. But before we dive into this week's topic of jobs, old jobs, new jobs, any comments, Reza, on, on the message from Nicolas? I would say exactly the same as Craig, Nicolas, that your pronunciation was extremely good and I understood absolutely everything you said. Uh, so keep it up. Good work. I particularly liked what Nicholas said at the beginning. He said, it's a long time since I last reached out to you. To reach out to someone is to get in contact with them or get in touch with them. And that use of since with reaching out to people is really effective when you start your message, when you start your conversation to say, oh, it's been a long time. It's been a long time since I last reached out to you. So fantastic expression there, Nicolas. There is one little thing, though, that you said, Nicolas, I think we could improve. Did he say taking importance lately? I think I heard those words. Yeah, it's that collocation that's not quite right, is it? Are there any other options that he could have used instead of to take importance? Yeah, you could say that something is of growing importance, perhaps, or becoming increasingly important or increased importance. Something like that uh, would be better than what you said, Nicholas. So based on Nicholas's message, we'd like to speak a little about old or long established jobs that uh, we know and that have been around for a while or maybe have disappeared. And of course, in his message, Nicholas said that he's a biomedical engineer, which 
I wasn't sure exactly what that involves, although Nicholas did explain a little about it. It seems like it's creating maybe artificial organs for the body. So maybe an artificial heart or, or some kind of organ inside the body that you make and then you you could put in the body with surgery. And of course, these days, surgery is done by robots in some cases. So surgical robots will be another example of biomedical engineering and advanced prosthetics. Advanced prosthetics, if you need a false arm or a false leg, they've really evolved the way that they can mimic or imitate your limbs so that they're almost like a real limb. So it's a fascinating area of of study. Yes, um, uh, biomedical engineers can really give you a hand with that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. As soon as it came out, I thought, oh, put, put it back in. Don't say that, Rizzo. Do, do you think we've put our foot in it? I think you put your foot in it. Yes, definitely. So let's look at some long established jobs, uh, jobs that maybe have disappeared. Well, just before we talk about old jobs and new jobs, let's just um, clarify a few really basic important uh, expressions. Unfortunately, you may have been laid off during the COVID-19 crisis to be laid off. In other words, maybe you lost your job. They didn't need you anymore. To get the sack means that you've lost your job because you you did something that they didn't like. Yeah, if, if it's because of something like the COVID and the company doesn't have money through COVID-19 or because their company are going to close, we normally say to be laid off or to lose your job. To get the sack is more for when you've, you're not a good worker, isn't it? Yeah, you're always late or you're stealing from the company or you're very, very bad at your job. You might get the sack or, yeah. Have you ever been fired or have you ever got the sack from Yes, and the company were maybe right to sack me. It was selling newspapers in the streets of Berlin. They gave me only about 30 papers to sell in the morning in four hours and I sold about five. So they they were quite right to sack me, I have to say. Was it a big issue where you had to move? No, no it was big issue? Der, der Tagesspiegel. Ah. So I learned to say, Der Tagesspiegel, eine Mark, bitte, danke. <laughs> and not much else. The days of marks, yeah, before the euro. So why didn't you sell many? To be honest, my English um, friend who was always also there, he got sacked as well. He sold a bit more than me, but they put us in terrible places where we were never going to sell it. They, they sent us to... Areas which had been in East Berlin until a few years before, the wall had been there beside factories, and um, they asked us to sell a newspaper which was kind of a very kind of liberal, kind of West German paper. So kind of industrial, very working class factory areas of East Berlin. Nobody was ever going to buy it. We hadn't hope in hell of selling it. Yeah. Oh, that, that's why we didn't sell any, and they, they sacked us. Another expression when you lose your job, you could be made unemployed, or you can just say that at the moment I am unemployed. And a more informal expression, if you are unemployed and you're claiming social security from the government, you can say you are on the dole. On the dole. That's D O L E. E. And I've heard some students use that in Cambridge speaking tests, for example, at a more advanced level. And it's fine. It's OK. Although if you're in a job interview, I would not recommend you use that expression. It's much nicer to say I'm between jobs at the moment, which means you're unemployed or you're on the dole. But it just sounds nicer. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm between jobs and I'm studying or doing whatever sounds much nicer than to be on the dole. That has kind of negative connotations, doesn't it? Another nice positive one is I'm looking for work. Yes, that's active. Always use the present continuous because it's active. I'm working on it. I'm looking for jobs. Yeah. To be on the dole in Spanish is doing el paro, which, as you know, doesn't sound so positive. You can be made redundant. Now, If you get the sack, you possibly did something wrong or something your employer did not like. But if you have been made redundant, 
That could be because the company needs to save money. They need to cut back. That phrasal verb to cut back means reduce costs. So unfortunately, they have to make you redundant. And it's very common to get a payment, a redundancy payment, when you are made unemployed because it's not your fault, but the company needs to save money. And whenever your boss calls you in to tell you that they're going to make you redundant, what he or she might say is, we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> Which sounds nicer than fire you, doesn't it? We're going to let you go. It's like, if, if you want to go, you can go. You know, we'll, <laughs> we'll let you. We'll give you permission to go. But that's not what they're really saying. They're saying uh, you're being made redundant. You have to go. But it's a nice way of saying it. So to be let go is to be made redundant in a, in a nicer euphemistic way. Or to be dismissed. I'm sorry, but we have to dismiss you. So if you're dismissed, then you've done something wrong. Yeah. And you may hear in the news these days to be on furlough. And the spelling's a bit strange with that word. It's F-U-R-L-O-U-G-H, to be on furlough. And in Spanish, do you know the translation? Well, uh, I don't think it really existed before. So now it's ERTE, this thing which they've just invented in Spain this year. El ERTE. So you've been made temporarily redundant. So you're redundant, but the company will take you back when they can. And the first verb that Reza introduced was to be laid off. But you can use that as a noun. So it's a layoff, L-A-Y-O-F-F. That's the noun. So a furlough is a temporary layoff from work. So people who get furloughed usually get to return to their job after the furlough, we hope anyway. With many of the verbs here, I don't know if you noticed, uh, listeners, that they were in the passive form. To be laid off, to be fired, to be made unemployed. So something was done to you. Your boss said that you have to go, unfortunately. But you could make them active, but bear in mind who's doing what. So, for example, if you say, I was sacked, you mean... I was sacked by my boss. In other words, my boss sacked me. So you have to think who's going to be the subject of the verb. So I was sacked by my boss. Passive equals my boss sacked me. And it would be the same for I was laid off. My boss laid me off. I was made redundant. My boss made me redundant, etc. Let's look at some jobs now that are no longer in existence or fading fast or disappearing fast. For example, a production line worker. Now, Reza's shaking his head at me, so I think we might have to discuss this. Let me make my point first. In the Industrial Revolution, when factories started employing people to work on the production line and stand there inspecting everything that passes through. Think of cars, for example. Someone would have to put the wheels on, someone would have to put the windscreen on, the doors on, etc. Well, these days, slowly and gradually, and in more recent years, a bit quicker, these people are being replaced by robots. So my point is, I think in the future, there will be no humans working on production lines. The only humans will be checking that the machines are doing what they're supposed to do. Right, yeah. Okay, I misunderstood, Craig. I thought, I thought when we were speaking about this earlier that he, he was saying that production lines will disappear. Okay, so he, he, he agrees with me that they won't disappear. The worker. But it's the workers that will disappear. There'll only be workers to check that the robots are working, right? Yes, I think that they won't disappear, but their job description will change. So they won't be standing there with tools, tightening the nuts and the bolts and the things on the machine they'll be checking that the robot is working correctly and maybe even programming the computer and the robot to do the job that humans used to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think you're right that it will go that way. I'm not sure if absolutely all 
the manual workers will disappear. But yes, I do agree with that, that a large part of the manual workers will disappear. Let me ask you a question, Reza. When was the last time you taught telephone English? And if you remember when it was, were you teaching words like, I'll put you through and hold the line, please? A long time ago. A long time ago, yeah. Already that type of language is not used very often, is it? We're talking at least 20 years ago. I think Craig's talking about the type of work that a switchboard operator used to do. Yeah, they don't, they don't have them anymore, do they? The switchboard operator used to connect you in a large company to a particular department. You'd say, can you put me through to the sales department? Well, now it's all automated, isn't it? Yeah. So that's a job which is nearly already gone and not many left now. My mum used to be a switchboard operator ah. yeah, after the Second World War. She worked for a few years plugging in lines on a big switchboard on the wall and that hold the line please sir and then connecting <laughs> yeah <they laughs> connecting people that's right of course they didn't even have a button to do it they had to take a, a cable from somewhere and put it in yeah, somewhere like else. a plug <laughs> a lighthouse is un faro and the person who looks after the lighthouse is a lighthouse keeper and i think that job might be on the rocks <laughs> oh, very good. What does that mean, on very the rocks? Very good. On the rocks means in a really difficult position, <laughs> not looking good. Yeah, very good. Because, of course, lighthouse keepers protect ships from crashing against the rocks. Good joke by Craig. Can you think of any other jobs that might be disappearing or have disappeared? One of them, which is, as you said earlier, on the rocks also, is a film projectionist or movie projectionist. That's the person who, in the cinema, in the cinema, projects the image from the film onto the screen. That doesn't exist anymore, does it? There's a few, I think, particularly in kind of poorer countries, uh -huh. but a lot of it now has become digital, so they don't need a person to do it. But still, there are some cinemas which are not digital, and so they would have a big reel, that's R-E-E-L, the round object where the film is wrapped around and they have to put that on the machine and know where to point it. Another job that's definitely disappeared, I think, unless maybe in the very specialised hotels, expensive hotels perhaps, and that's the elevator operator, the lift operator, the bellhop, B-E-L-L-H-O-P, or sometimes you hear the word bellboy. But doesn't a bellboy take the bags to the room? Is that the same person? Could be. But technically speaking, it, it should be the person who merely operates the lift. So they're not supposed to leave the lift, the elevator. So they press the button for you and they make sure they open the doors for you. And I can't remember the last time I saw a person operating a lift or an elevator. Yeah, well, Craig and I don't see such things because, as he said, they're only in very exclusive five-star hotels. Yeah. So <laughs> they exist somewhere, but we don't see them. <laughs> Craig, what do you think about shopkeepers and shop assistants? Do you think they're on the way out because of online shopping? Possibly. I don't know if they'll disappear completely because I think there'll always be a market for, as I said before, personal attention, maybe in more expensive shops. There'll be shopkeepers and assistants to help you shop. But if you think of the rise of Amazon and other online shopping, do people really, some people say they like to touch things before they buy, try on clothes, but more and more, especially with the pandemic, we're seeing people shopping online because they feel safer and also because it's more convenient. What do you think? Well, for me personally, I think there will be fewer and fewer shopkeepers and shop assistants. The shopkeeper, by the way, is the person who owns the shop and the shop assistant just works in the shop. I have never bought clothes online in my life and I have no intention of doing it. I just think it's, it's not a good idea. No offence to many of our listeners who I'm sure do, but I hate shopping for clothes, yet I insist on trying them on. I'm not going to buy clothes before I try them on. So for me, I, I, I don't think clothes shops will disappear. There, there are other people who want to try clothes on before they buy them, I think. Or touch the material. Yeah, and see what it's like. But the size, I mean, L-A-M-A-S-A, -A -A L-M-S, that means nothing. Some brands for me are L large. Some I need an extra large. Others I fit in medium. So it's meaningless unless you try it on. It doesn't have any meaning at all, the, the size. 
Well, I have bought online a couple of times jackets, not necessarily things that need to fit exactly. And I've been quite happy with it because the the website went into a lot of detail about the measurement of your shoulders, the measurement of your waist, the sleeves. So everything was measured. And if you measure yourself correctly, and there are lots of sizes to choose from, in theory, you should get what you want. But I see your point. I think sometimes it's much nicer to try on the clothes. A very old job, which has disappeared in many countries already, but not some, including the United Kingdom and Spain, is the job of king or queen or it, a royal. Is it, is it a job, though? It is, technically. You don't, you don't apply for it. You, you're born into it. But you're born into it, but you do get an allowance. You get money for doing it. So you could say it's a job. As you know, Spain has a king. The United Kingdom has a queen. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly not a job that's disappeared. It must be tiring to do all that waving every day. (laughs) (laughs) Sitting in the car and waving. Oh, my God. And and how much do they pay them? (laughs) Uh, They do okay, I think. They do do okay. Yeah. Craig, what about the oldest profession of all? What would that be in your mind? English teaching? Probably, yeah. (laughs) Or or maybe Latin teaching uh, before that. (laughs) A prostitute. Yeah. Sad sex worker. It's mentioned in the Bible, and according to historians, it's probably the very first profession. Let's put that in speech marks into comillas that's existed. As far as humans, as long as humans have existed, there have been men who are willing to pay in some way women to have sex. So it's there's no older job than that. Will that disappear? Well, I'm guessing it suffered a lot in recent months with the coronavirus pandemic Uh, whether it will disappear completely probably not i think there'll always be a market there for sex workers well i'm no expert let let that go on the record (laughs) in this area but from what i've seen in documentaries or whatever the sex working job market prostitution is much bigger now than it was 20 or 30 years ago much much bigger. it's grown largely because of internet So, internet, in a way, has helped the oldest profession ever, curiously enough. Let's move on to new jobs. Nicholas mentioned a biomedical engineer, which is a pretty new job, isn't it? Probably only in recent years that's become popular. Can you think of any other jobs that might have been recently introduced? Yes, because we spend so much time these days online, online meeting facilitators are people who have seen a huge increase in work recently. They're the people who facilitate, who arrange for other people to meet online. So they're having a golden era at the minute. I actually know a couple of people that do that for a living and they make very good money. So if you like technology and you'd like to facilitate a meeting online, I think that's something that's very interesting, probably very satisfying as well. Another profession is a delivery cyclist or a delivery person, anyone who's bringing things to your house and to your home, not only in the current situation of coronavirus, but in general for convenience when people are working so much. They may need services so that they don't have to go out and do shopping or get things done or service the car or any of the things that the mundane things that you have to do. It might be better for them to pay somebody to do it. And that's also a growing area on Internet. There's lots of Internet companies that are offering these services where you can pay somebody to deliver things to your house or do things for you, small jobs. For me, during the coronavirus lockdown, the growth of delivery cyclists has been far and away, that means without any doubt whatsoever, the most obvious growth in uh, work that there's been in Valencia. Mm -hmm. Uh, I live much near the center of the city than Craig, and I can tell you that I cannot remember the last time that I was outside my flat and didn't see a delivery cyclist, be it night or day. And they tend to be on bicycles rather than scooters or motorbikes? Mostly cycles, yeah. But sometimes scooters, motorbikes, but the vast majority now is cyclists. I tell you, it's impossible for me not to see several every time I leave my flat. 
definitely there was a huge surge because of the coronavirus lockdown. But I think they're here to stay. I mean, they existed before, but I don't think they'll go back to their normal activity after the lockdown. I think they'll remain really popular now because people have got used to it. Yeah, they like the convenience of it. Yeah. Obviously, if you can afford it, yeah. Another interesting area, private car hire drivers. So I'm guessing here you mean services like Lyft and Uber. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there'll be a time when these services eradicate, which means remove taxi drivers? Yes, definitely. So taxi drivers should probably be working for companies like Lyft and Uber. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the time will come when I think there won't be any taxi drivers. But I'm not, I'm not suggesting that taxi drivers now should should change, but I I bet plenty of them have. I actually have a lot of sympathy for taxi drivers because they're required by law to take many, many measures that private car hire drivers are not obliged to do to effectively carry out the same job. So I have a lot of sympathy for taxi drivers. I think they're kind of fighting a losing battle in a way. I think, yeah, technology is going to uh, overcome them, maybe even with self-driving cars, because I've noticed here in Valencia, there are those scooters you see all around the place. I can't remember the name of the company, but it's a green colored scooter that you can rent using an app on your phone. Maybe there'll be cars like that soon as well, or at least self-driving cars that you can pick up and you won't need a taxi driver. Another uh, job that's growing, obviously, is virtual teams consultant. So a team consultant is not a new job, but a virtual teams consultant is what makes it new. So people are giving their consultancy advice online to teams nowadays. And I know I have a good friend who does that. She's based in London. I have to mention her because we did a podcast together a few years ago, Pilar Ortiz. And her podcast is called Virtual Not Distant. So if that is your area, if you're interested in virtual teams consultancy, go and listen to her podcast. You'll learn a lot. And she's been working in this area for quite a long time. Obviously, with the virus, many, many companies now are working virtually in a team. So they need to be able to communicate effectively using the correct tools online and having clear communication. According to the American president, Donald Trump, and his data detectives, China is involved in industrial espionage in the world of technology these days. I don't know what the evidence is, but according to Donald Trump, data detectives have found evidence that China is trying to infiltrate uh, technological advances in the United States. So a data detective is someone who finds out what's happening with the use of data. Like a modern-day Colombo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another area which is a growing space these days, and I had to check this, I wasn't sure exactly what it was, edge computing. Edge is E-D-G-E, -E, edge computing. And it's computing that's much closer to the device for example, many things that we use in technology these days are connected to the cloud. And in order to work or collect data, then the information needs to go up to the cloud and then back down to you. So the idea of edge computing to reduce latency, and latency is the delay in communicating data, then it's much more effective and cheaper if it's collected if the information is collected and used closer to the device. So an example of this would be a self-driving car. It would take a long time, not a long time, it would take longer for the information that a self-driving car is seeing with its cameras to go up to the internet and back down again to the car. It will be much quicker and effective if that information, and safer, if that information were dealt with inside the car in an inbuilt computer. So that, I think, is what edge computing is. And if I have not explained that correctly, please get in touch, all you technophiles out there who know more about this than I do, and correct me if I'm wrong.
also in technology, the user experience design, interaction design people. They are people who make the internet of things a lot easier for normal people like us to use. So they would design interfaces. They would design the way we interact with technology. Let's say you have a computer in your fridge that tells you when you need to order more eggs or more milk. Obviously, that needs to be very user-friendly. The way it's designed, the way you interact with it, needs to be designed so that people can use it very easily and not make it too complicated. So that's UX or interaction design. Digital marketing is another interesting area because years ago we used to have banners on web pages, but digital marketing is an area of selling things through the internet and through digital devices. So that's an interesting area if you're interested in sales. Another job which isn't that new, but uh, there are new branches of it all the time, is stem cell research. So a stem cell researcher is a person who using stem cells, that's células madres in Spanish, is finding new cures and treatments for many diseases with the help of technology. Also because we are a consumerist society and constantly throwing things away, waste management consultant is an interesting job because where do you put all the rubbish obviously recycling being green taking care of the environment is a very popular topic so how we dispose of our waste of our rubbish in a good way in a clean way is an interesting area of development at the moment waste management consultant i hope these jobs are giving you some ideas if you're thinking of your career when you finish studying or maybe even changing your career if you found yourself unemployed. So what's the next one? Craig already mentioned robotics. So obviously we need more robotics technician, a much more low tech job, but very important, particularly if you're extremely wealthy, is to have a personal shopper. This is someone who receives money for going to shop for another person. Would you use one? Based on your comments on clothes, I'm guessing you would never use a personal shopper. No, no way. Not for clothes, but I would for other things. If I had the money, yeah, to go and buy books and software and hardware. Yeah, why not? But not for clothes. And of course, these days, I guess there are more and more online personal shoppers. So it's a fairly new idea. And then having to go online is... A necessity of the of the lockdown so i guess many personal shoppers now work through the computer i suppose it, it's based around how much an hour of your time is worth if you're working if you are employed and you're earning let's say 30 euros an hour then if you can pay somebody 10 or 15 euros an hour to do a job for you that you don't want to do or don't have time to do then it's worth it But obviously, if you're not earning enough, then it's not worth it. So I think it depends on your hourly worth and how much you're earning. Craig, last but not least, there's us podcasters. Fairly new job. Are we on the rise? We are on the rise. We are growing, but very slowly. There's some interesting things happening in the podcasting space at the moment that I won't bore you with. But yeah, it's it's something that is thankfully on the rise in popularity, although not so much in salary, because it's very difficult to make money doing podcasts. Craig, we already mentioned some jobs which have disappeared, and there are some which right now are in big trouble because of the coronavirus. Do you think they'll disappear? For example, car mechanics or car park attendants, will they disappear? I think they are disappearing. I think car mechanics are not as needed because many cars have closed engines these days. They function with computers that need very low maintenance. And car park attendants, it's a machine, isn't it? You get your ticket, you pay your money. I very rarely see people working, real humans working in a car park these days. What about a travel agent? When was the last time you used one of those? Travel agents online, I think, have a future. Travel agents in shops that you walk into, no. Even when we start travelling again and we start flying and going on holiday and travelling around the world, when was the last time you went into a travel agent to arrange a trip? Many years ago. Yeah, it's all online, isn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine what it must be like for travel agents who worked face-to-face in a shop? 
already their industry was in decline and then the coronavirus arrived. So you can't go to their shop because it's not allowed to not be able to buy a ticket anywhere because you can't go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really not a good time for face-to-face travel agents. What about politicians? Do you think they'll disappear? Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. <laughs> if only. If only, but I'm afraid I don't think so. I, I wish they would, but I don't think they would. I think people are fed up. They're fed up, which is Arta. They're, they've had enough of politicians in many countries and maybe that they should be a bit careful going forward because do we really need them? I don't know. Oh, oh we don't need them, but I've just a, f- a feeling they're going to protect themselves and there's nothing that will get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> if there are any politicians listening, what do you think? <laughs> What about the world uh, in the countryside? What about things like farmers, ranchers, agricultural workers? Do they have a future? Oh, that's a good question. I think that farmers are in trouble, aren't they? I think in many places, farmers are having a hard time because of bioengineering, maybe in food. But we need to eat their produce. We need to eat food. Yeah, but so much of it's mechanised these days. Irrigation is now run by computer. Lots of it is mechanised, so I'm not sure. And I think prices are also affecting farmers a lot. The price that they can sell their crops for, a crop is cosecha. So it's difficult for farmers at the moment. What about people who work in offices, office clerks, people involved in filing, photocopying, data entry, etc. in an office? No, I think that's a dying profession. I think these days everything's online. We're not using paper hardly at all. Are we photocopying very much? I don't think so. I mean, we do as teachers, don't we? We photocopy, but it's not. Uh, I don't think that's going to last very long. Postal service workers? I think there'll always be some postal service, but vastly reduced. When was the last time you went to the post office? Oh, probably last year. Me too. Think, yeah, so quite a while a ago. A long time ago. Although, of course, delivery services are on the up. They're taking over from the traditional state postal service, aren't they? And because we don't send letters, we're emailing all the time. I don't remember the last time I received a letter, a physical letter. And finally, teachers. What's going to happen to teachers, Reza? Are we going to be taken over by AI algorithms? We spoke recently about the Cambridge English Write and Improve writing site that's very good for checking your writing by a computer. Do people need teachers to do that? There's speech recognition where people can have conversations with their Amazon Echo. I won't say the word in case yours starts working. It's A-L-E-X-A. And then there's S-I-R-I, which is the, the Apple phone. So these AI machines that use the internet to speak to you, do you see our job disappearing? Um... I think there'll be fewer teachers, yeah. I don't think we'll disappear, but I think there'll be more things like videos, teaching people things. But I think a lot of the videos will be presented by teachers. But of course, then you don't need as many teachers. All they have to do is record the video and that can go out to millions and millions of people. But what about interaction, correcting people's speaking, correcting people's writing? Can you see computers doing that? No. I think, uh, in my opinion, computers are f- not that great. So you mentioned the, the Cambridge English Write and Improve. I think there are some mistakes that go under the radar. What does, what does go under the radar mean? Under the radar. So radar detects, you know, where things are flying, where they're moving. So under the radar means it won't be detected. Yeah. Above all, questions of register and style. A computer doesn't get it when I say, dear sir, madam, how is it going? Uh, you would never write that. And particularly if I don't write hows, if I write how is it going, because it might be programmed to detect the contraction as informal, but it's not going to know that how is it going is not an appropriate way to start a formal letter. I think it's quite easy to fool computer that way. I would not start a job application that way. I don't think they'll read past your first sentence, <laughs> no matter how good your English is. If you get the style wrong, the register, computer style register, there ain't an algorithm yet invented to quite nail it. It might be in the future, but not yet. I don't think so. What do you think? I'm not sure I agree with you. I think the time's getting very close that we're not going to be needed. I think that last week when we spoke about the development of language, we said that three quarters of the people in the world, 75% are non-native speakers of English. And I think the lines between, for example, 
formal informal English are going to blur and it's not really going to be that important the style and register as it used to be maybe in exams yes if you need to pass an exam you need to know that's a test but I think in general business communication and other ways I don't know how important it's going to be and I think machines are getting better all the time and I think they will start replacing teachers very soon I hope I'm wrong we'll see Craig, are there any jobs that we haven't mentioned that you'd like to disappear? You think they're useless, you don't like them, you won't miss them at all if they go? Ooh, all of them. Yeah. I would like to see all jobs eradicated. I would like to see us not doing any <laughs> anything that we don't want to do. So I would like robots to do everything for me. And then the whole world would have enough food and we could sit around philosophizing and creating art and and just thinking and doing what we want to do to develop ourselves and i'd love a world where there was no war and we didn't have to make arms to kill each other and everybody had food and a place to to live that would be so no 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 work no jobs that's what if you're asking me i would like all of the work to disappear you describe a utopia yeah without work what's your opinion uh, yeah if if that could be the case brain but I, I can't see it happening but i hope <laughs> i hope so we can dream <laughs> that's all we can do craig is there any new job which does exist but you think it's not really very helpful not very necessary you don't really know why it's being created or or you wish it would just disappear uh no i can't but i'm i think you probably know one do, do you can you guess what i'm going to say no well, I have a funny feeling Craig's going to edit this out anyway to be on the safe side because I might bother some listeners, but lifestyle YouTubers. I could live without them, <laughs> to be honest. What, what's a lifestyle YouTuber? A person who appears on YouTube making clips about what, what they're having for lunch and, you know, where they like to buy their clothes and all that. <laughs> I, I couldn't give a... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they exist, to be honest, but... I may be the minority, means people do follow them, but I, I don't get it. When I say I don't get it, it's not a P.O. I've, I've got other things to do in my life than watch them. What do, what do you think? Am I way off course here? In general, I, I agree with you, although I must admit I have watched one or two of the more popular lifestyle bloggers because they are entertaining. But one job we maybe should have mentioned as a new job is a digital nomad. And that kind of annoys me because on social media, you see these people with their laptops sitting on the beach working. I can't see anybody here sitting. I mean, where are these people, these digital nomads that are making loads of money, traveling around the world and just enjoying themselves in cafes and doing a bit of work for a couple of hours a day? And they're all over the Internet. And I, that kind of annoys me a little bit because I don't quite believe that it's that easy. Maybe it's just an image they've created and it's not reality. Yeah, and also you don't see the negative side. You only see the positive side to it. You don't see the problems they have. You just see the fantastic lifestyle of them sipping pina colada on a beach in Mexico somewhere. And now it's your turn to practice your English. We would love to hear from you. We do enjoy getting your voice messages. If you'd like to send us a voice message, go to speakpipe.com. That's S-P-E-A-K-P-I-P-E slash English podcast or you could send us an email with a comment or question reza where do they go send an email to me belfast reza at gmail.com or craig he's at craig at english podcast.com and maybe you would like to visit the mansion english online store to look at some courses some paid courses you can find that at store s-t-o-r-e dot mansion english Net, and the link is in the show notes. This is episode 321. As ever, thanks to all of you who are helping us. You're supporting this podcast through Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-M dot com slash English podcast. And uh, those people, by donating as little as $1 a month, they get instant access to recent transcriptions and that money helps us to pay to get the transcriptions done so thank you very much to all of you who help us unfortunately we can't list everybody's name because we don't have time but we we can mention the most recent new sponsors 
Yes, we've had four so far this month. They are Antonio Tarsis, thank you. Quiero Ser Portero is another, another lovely Patreon supporter. Thank you very much, Quiero. Rafa Blasco and Ana Robles. If you would like to join these wonderful people for as little as $1 per month, you get instant access to recent transcriptions. Go to patreon.com slash ingles podcast. Reza, what are we talking about on next week's episode? Next week, we've got three words. Keen, enthusiastic, and eager. Well, I'm very eager to be speaking about those three words next week. <laughs> Until then, we hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you for listening. It's goodbye from Reza. And bye-bye from Craig. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. Music also by Martin De Boer. The track was Mixed Pleasures. And by Matt McFarland. The track was Mysterio.